Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. I'm Isabella Tabarovsky, Senior Program Associate with the Kennan Institute, and I'm delighted to have with us today uh, Maria Pierci Khalidi Polkov, who I will introduce in just one moment as we discuss uh, the upcoming film uh, Navalny and then more generally the situation uh, in Russia, what the Navalny team is doing today and its view on the, on the current situation. Before we begin, I encourage you to stay up to date on the latest Canon Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our two blogs, Focus Ukraine and the Russia File, as well as our podcast, Canon X and the Russia File. Visit our Hindsight Upfront Ukraine collection on the Wilson website for the latest news and analysis focused on Ukraine. If you'd like to ask a question during the course of this conversation, you can submit it by email to canon at wilsoncenter.org via Twitter at Canon Institute or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation when sending your questions. I will begin by introducing our speakers. I'll start with Leonid Volkov. Leonid Volkov is Chief of Staff for Alexei Navalny and Political Director of Navalny's team. He was campaign manager for Navalny's mayoral campaign in Moscow in 2013, as well as for his bid to get into the presidential ballot in 2018. Before 2017, 2021, Leonid created and led Team Navalny's network of regional offices in 45 of Russia's largest cities. He has operated from abroad since 2019. There are seven politically motivated criminal cases brought against him in Russia. An IT professional by background, Leonid is also the co-founder of the Internet Protection Society, Russia's leading digital rights NGO. And we're also joined by Maria Pevci, who is the head of the investigation department at the Anti-Corruption Foundation, a Russian nonprofit organization founded by Alexei Navalny to investigate and expose the cases of corruption among the Russian elites. During her 11 years of work, she authored over 100 investigations, most famously of Vladimir Putin's private palace on the Black Sea, which received over 120 million views on YouTube. Maria, I think I want to start with you and ask you to tell us what you can. We understand that you can't uh, say a lot, but whatever you can about the film Navalny, the documentary that uh, was shown last week uh, in a limited release across the US and at some point will be shown uh, more broadly on streaming services. So please go ahead and tell us what you can about the film. Yeah, well, I um, I'm almost I almost don't want to tell you anything about the film because I want everybody to go and watch it for themselves, um, because that would be the best way to actually you know see what it's it's about. Um, I think the um, there will be a chance to do that in the US um, next week on the 24th or 25th of April, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it will be on um, CNN. But as a teaser, um, uh, the, the, the documentary covers the period of time when Alexei recovered from uh, being poisoned with a chemical weapon with Novichok in Berlin uh, to the day that he left Germany to fly back to Russia and to be subsequently arrested there upon arrival. Um, so the documentary co covers this couple of months. Um, and within this two and a half or three months, we've been busy with um, investigating who actually poisoned uh, Navalny and uh, who was the one behind using chem chemical weapons against uh, Putin's main opponent. And um, together with Bellingcat, uh, we managed to find a team of um, chemical um, weapons experts who are working secretly in Russia um, as a team of um, assassins, essentially, um, who just um, get rid of those people who Putin doesn't really like. Well, and the film was really uh, received really well at Sundance. I want to uh, say that it received, I believe it's the audience favorites award. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It received two, uh, two awards, in fact. Yeah. Best US Documentary, the Audience Prize, and also the film, the Festival Favorite. This is um, a very unique award that hasn't been, um, that hasn't been around for the last, I don't know, more than 10 years, I think. Uh, so that's an overall, most liked um, film by the audience among fiction and non-fiction films. So this is pretty outstanding reception, I would say. Absolutely. And the film certainly watches as a thriller. I mean, it's an extraordinarily well uh, put together film. What do you think, uh, what do you think contributed to, uh, is that what contributed to audiences response at Sundance? So do you think, uh, what, what do you think spoke 
to the audiences. I think Alexei Navalny spoke to the audience, really. I mean, the story is pretty good. Well, I have to I have to say that the um, the you know the whole like the actual investigation is fun, and um, we actually got to speak to one of the poisoners on the phone. Uh, but to be honest, I think the the reason why it has been so well received is it's that it, it's just Navalny really. He really opens up and he really shines and in this documentary, and he himself gave so much to this film. He invested so much of his time and effort. Um, and I think it's just very well received because people um, who didn't know who Navalny was, who knew just the name maybe from, from the newspapers, they uh, finally um, saw the real person behind that name yeah. and that person turned out to be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I agree because you really see him, you see him with Yulia, his wife and with the children. It's a really, you see a very personal side of Alexei, which I think is really, really um it's it's something very different that I think especially American audiences don't see very well. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to create too many spoilers here. And I think, as you say, I would want for our audiences to see to see for themselves and uh, judge it for themselves. And I highly, highly recommend it. Um, I want to ask uh, maybe Leonid, uh, what can you say? I only want to ask it because I know that our audiences want to hear about it. Uh, if there's anything that you can tell us uh, about what's happening with Alexei right now, uh, what's um, you know what's the situation? Is there anything that that maybe you can say that we don't know from the news? It's whatever you can tell us. No, uh, everything you know uh, from the news is correct. There are no new developments, and that's very good news actually. Absence of bad news is is the best news in this current situation. So uh, he is in the same colony which is not a nice place to be, but at least uh, we know how life is organized there. We are able to stay in touch. In fact, he's working hard. So that's, that's, that's pretty much the thing that many people probably don't properly get, but he is an acting head and leader of our organization. He's really working hard. He maintains, he maintains contact with, with many uh, supporters through like well the the snail mail exchange and so on and he's perfectly like in touch with what's going on like we, we discuss our like strategic plans with him a lot and so on. that's of course all undergoes like censorship and that's not the 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 best and the easiest possible way to communicate but still it's very essential that we are able to communicate and he has like a perfect understanding of what's actually going on and i mean you can follow it like you can read his posts on instagram and twitter they are his own so that that's he um uh, publishes them through the lawyers of course he, he doesn't have internet access there but from the content on this uh uh posts on, on twitter and instagram you could easily say that he's perfectly in touch with the reality unlike Putin. Right. And I, I very much appreciate his the threads that he's been posting uh, on uh, on Twitter and his Telegram channel. And those who don't follow him, I really highly recommend it because it's truly his his analysis from, from prison colony is much clearer than, uh, than, than, as you say, than probably Putin, uh, the, the awareness that Putin has of the situation. Leonid, I want to stay with you and I want to ask you, um, you released recently a video where you gave your viewers sort of a good number of reasons to be optimistic, which is pretty, uh, some people might consider it strange to hear that there are reasons to be optimistic in the current situation. So um, I, I wonder if we can go over those because I think that they touch on many of the things that interest Americans as well as they view the situation and try to understand what's happening in Russia. So. The one thing, the, the first thing you named was that um, was that the war, the one reason to be optimistic that the war dramatically shortened Putin's term. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm, yeah, first of all, thank you for watching. The video has been only released like five hours ago. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we well, follow closely uh, what your team does. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's very nice to hear. Uh, look, uh, so I don't want to retell the whole video. It's like 25 minutes long and I don't want to spend 25 minutes on this. But indeed the main point is that um, Putin has shortened his term 
and I'm saying it as a, like scientific fact as a mathematician, like Putin's term is a mathematical expectation of um, outcomes of possible scenarios. And of course, um, the worst scenario on the table for Russia, the worst scenario for Russia was always has always been the, the biological scenario, which we also discussed, I believe, during previous events at Kamen, that Putin will be able to stay in Kremlin until he dies. And unfortunately, this was very feasible. This happened to, to Francesco Franco. This happened to Salazar. This happened to many other leaders who ended up as being like very unpopular, very weak dictators, but still strong of the dictators enough to keep the group in power with their system of uh, electoral commissions and with their system of repression and with their system of courts and so on. So, so like Francesco Franco uh, kept going for like for 40 years and he made like Spain one of the worst economies in, 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 in Europe, worst performing economies in Europe by, by, by the time of his death in 1975. And this is something that could have happened in Russia as well. Like uh, we know a lot about like Putin's like personal doctors, his obsession with healthcare could last for another 20 years. And this is of course like the enormously bad scenario because this would leave Russia so much behind the whole world. So now we consider the probability of the, the, the things that the probability of this scenario has dramatically decreased. It's not zero, of course, but well, it, it has been like 80%. Now it's maybe like 20%. And uh, respectfully, respectively, the, the probability of two other scenarios has grown, which is like the, the elite conflict or like the, some popular uprising, some black swan coming and so on. These are still probabilities. All scenarios are still on the table. But of course, mm, when Putin miscalculated to, to start this war, to launch this war, he very much affected those probabilities because it's, it will be an enormous challenge for him now to find another point of, of stability for the system that he's built. He knew how to operate the system as of February 23, um, 2022, and he could have keep going for 20 more years. But the new system, he doesn't know how to operate and the chances are not so high that he will be able to find a new point of stability. Well, and I think that it's something that uh, your entire team, and certainly both of you, um, are, are working to sort of to help um, to to speak to the Russian audiences in a way that uh, that would explain this new reality to them and reach them in these new ways and perhaps accelerate the change and counteract the propaganda bubble that they live in. Uh, Maria, I wonder. I know that you have a new program with. Georgi Alburov, that you regularly broadcast the news. Um, how do you, what are you trying? First of all, how do you, who is watching you? Do you feel like uh, Russian people are able to watch you, uh, people who are inside Russia? What are you doing to reach them? What do you think are the most important things to communicate to them at this point? Who, who is this question to? Uh, Maybe you. it's for you. It's for you. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, well, we, I don't need to guess anything. We have YouTube um, data that shows us that, yes, Russian people do watch us, and 90% um, of, 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 of the views they come from Russia. Well, I mean, it depends week on a week, but between 80 and 90% of our viewers are Russian. Um, they're from Russia, and then I think they, they, another big bulk is uh, from Ukraine, and then the rest, the rest is um, really irrelevant. And um, what we do to um, get through to our audiences, so first of all, well, we created this new YouTube channel called Popular Politics, and as opposed to our um, old um, existing YouTube channels, this is very much the news, I guess. It's a very news-based um, work that we do. So every day from... Um, day one of the war, every day at 7 p.m. we go live, um, different di different presenters, unprofessional like myself and Leonid and uh, Georgi Alburik, who you mentioned, and many, many other colleagues of ours. We um, stay on air for two to three hours um, to be able to just share whatever we've learned during the day about the war. It's not really complicated at all, um, given that 
um, every independent Russian media outlet has been um, shut down, closed uh, within the first week of the war. Um, we were pretty much the only ones standing, really, because um, everybody else have lost the um, um, offices, equipment, um, employees, and all of that. So we decided that we're going to temporarily assume those responsibility and going to turn from an anti-corruption NGO to um, news broadcasters. So we reinvented ourselves a little bit like that. And it all started with just a um, simple camera being turned on and um, us just talking to it, sharing, as I said, everything we know, everything we can verify, everything that seems reliable um, to counter position it to this uh, infinite government propaganda that is that is available everywhere that is literally just pouring on 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 on, on the russians from every device uh, on every um channel of um, <clears> the <throat> tv you will hear a variation of the same thought that putin is genius that putin is um is during this war, well, actually not war, a special operation they call it, to liberate the world, to stop our world war three, and that's actually not the war, it's it's the end of the war, you know, the, 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 the regular propaganda stuff. So um, we decided to just be loud and talk and explain as much as we can, dif difficult things in simple words, invite people, talk to Talk to talk talk to our you know guests who are kind enough to to to, to come and join our shows. Loads of um, Ukrainian politicians, in fact, who um, normally have zero access to the Russian audience. Now now they do. They come and they talk to us, and they are okay with talking to us. And we are doing our best to show that uh, there is an alternative point of view. And while YouTube is still accessible in Russia, and it is still the last one standing we will be sitting there and doing exactly the same thing every day at 7 p.m. Well, I, that's that's so important. And I, I, I wonder if you, because I think um, I heard perhaps, Lenny, you say, may, uh, or maybe I don't want to misquote, but I think, I mean, there are many people who actually express doubt in the notion that the level of support for Putin is as high as, uh, as some of the surveys report. And so, Perhaps there is reason to think that propaganda is not as effective as some imagine. What is your sense? Can you can you speak to that? Uh, and either one no, of you can can speak to that. There, there are no reliable numbers now. Uh, polling in traditional sense just doesn't work in a country which is at war and with with the worst wartime censorship imposed, where people just. Then it, you uh, you muted yourself accidentally. No, no, no I didn't. Okay. Um, so, like, for uh, where, where, where people could go to jail for, like, up to 15 years for, like, providing a sincere uh, answer to, to a pollster's question. So, we can't rely on the polling data that is, like, broadcasted now as a part of propaganda. Uh, we can try to like uh, explore what actually Russian society is thinking about now uh, using some more sophisticated uh, research methods and sometimes they reveal interesting data. Well, the, the society is not uh, homogeneous. It's, it's not united around Putin. It's, it's very diverse. Uh, the most important feeling now is fear like some people fear the consequences of the war some people fear of about like their future like the economic crisis and so on some people fear uh, about like have fears about like censorship and saying something wrong but this is a dominated uh, is a dominating feeling and of course for many people who feel this feeling the natural reaction, the, the, the self-protection reaction is kind of like to, 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 to adjust with the, with, the, with the strong people, kind of like to, to find shelter under, under auspices of, of, the, of the power, uh, just, just to wait, just, just to uh, 
like see where it goes. It doesn't have it. It doesn't have to be confused with support for Putin, with with, with love uh, to Putin. Like the genuine often support comes from maybe. 10% of population, like the most, like there are aggressive Putin supporters. They, have, they are outnumbered by very clear Putin's opponents, but, but the vast majority uh, of Russian population doesn't support him, doesn't oppose to him, but just try to find their way to survive under all these changing circumstances. And propaganda is not very efficient, but it provides them with this kind of like with a, with a shelter, with an explanation, with a with a chance to keep their mind intact, like not 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 to get crazy. Like propaganda at least provides them with some explanation that they could use for a while, like 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 a like a straw. Maria, do you have anything? To add to this, um, well, no, I think Lenny has explained this very well and and very thoroughly. I going to say just I will trash all sources. Okay, I think we just lost Maria. Oh, she'll, uh, probably, all right, well, she'll, she'll probably reconnect, but she, I'm it, sure. It some, oh, here she is. She she is coming. Maria, we lost you for a second. Okay, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Okay, um, it, it might take a while. Let's. You just crashed. Okay. All right. Well, Leonid, why don't I, uh, we'll, we'll let uh, Maria reestablish her connection. But um, here's what I wanted to ask you. Um, a lot of, uh, I've seen, I've seen people who have worked, uh, who have worked in television before when it was still possible to make good television programming in, um, in Russia. So I've seen them express an opinion that so much that, that really the level of belief in uh, in the regime is is far is far thinner than than people might think and that basically it would take a couple of weeks of good television to reorient people and this is i asked this question because we also got a question from the audience where somebody is asking well how do you change the mentality of people who are used to living hundreds of years under authoritarian regimes uh, what's what's uh, what's your sense? Do you think a lot of it is really just the propaganda that people are receiving, which gives them permission to to say that you know I don't have to go out into the streets, I don't have to oppose, everything is fine, or do you think there is something deeper than that? Oh, I very much second to what you said. It's this 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 layer of uh, this this crust of, of of propaganda is is really very thin. It's it's as I, as I already tried to explain it. It's just a protection, a very, a very thin shelter, just to just to be able to live a normal life. So this, people don't want to believe uh, they, they 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 belong now to well Nazi style aggressor nation. People don't want to believe there is war. People don't want to believe like all this is happening like in their name. So they try to save themselves uh, their integrity with the explanations that propaganda is providing. When they are gone, then the well hangover will be of course very dramatic, but it will follow suit like very very promptly. Uh, you talk about this hangover the day the day after the morning after uh, when Putin's regime is gone, and you say that it will be a painful moment where a lot of people uh, wake up to the truth and recognize what's happened and what would really happen in Ukraine. What do you think needs to? What do you see uh, yourselves as perhaps um, needing to do, and what do others need to do in order perhaps to? make this morning after a little bit lighter or does it, it is it kind of unavoidable it will be what it is um what what's the medicine for that do you think well if i would be allowed to <clears throat> summarize it in just two words 
these two words are Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan, which the defeated Germany has received after the Second World War to uh, like a hand reached to them, to, to help them to cope with the situation. Uh, there was no Marshall Plan for Russia after it has been defeated in the Cold War. And this exactly produced the trauma, the Versailles type trauma that allowed Putin to um, build all his mythology, all his narrative uh, uh, around this evil West, which kind of like only sought to destroy the Soviet Union, but uh, didn't, didn't help and wasn't a reliable, reliable partner and so on and so on. So Putin, uh, used this trauma exactly in the same way as, as Hitler uh, built his narrative around the Treaty of Versailles. And, uh, and Marshall Plan was a lesson learned by, 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 by the West from this sad story of the uh, Germany in the first two wars. So now this is once again the lessons that has to be learned. So after Putin, uh, uh, the West should not try to like forget about Russia for another like 25 years. Uh, because this is, well, frankly, what happened. Like when, when I was mm, at Yale in 2018 and I was visiting like many American universities uh, on their invitation. And it was very fun, uh, like a lot of fun, like going to Princeton, to Cornell, like speaking in very many distinguished places, but everywhere I saw like a generation gap, like, all Russian scholars were either people who used to do something on Russia like before 1991 or started to do something on Russia after 2014, after they started to realize that something is wrong there, like after annexation of Crimea. And for like 23 years, uh, nobody nobody just gave a damn about Russia. And that, that, that has been entirely wrong. Well, I think it's interesting because I feel like there is a bit of a sense now too that uh, we should just is isolate Russia. There are sanctions. We should just kind of let the Russians uh, do whatever they need to do to get rid of their evil regime and exclude them from polite society altogether. And what you're saying is that the West shouldn't forget Russia. The West should be paying attention to Russia. Uh, what do you think the West needs to do to help Russians kind of reorient themselves. I mean, aside from the regime, right? There is the regime and I think everybody is kind of clear that uh, what needs to be done. Uh, and Maria, you are, you, you're doing so many corruption investigations. You're, he you're head of that department that the West needs to understand. You've been talking about it for years. Um, uh, and so there are sanctions, but what is it that the West can do to help the broader Russian population perhaps change? Well, it's a difficult question to be honest. I think the, the honest answer is that West shouldn't do anything to help the broader Russians. Broader Russians are fine right by themselves and they are good and smart and educated people. And when they have access to uh, I don't know, free media, fair elections, they will, they will, you know, they will work out what to do and how to do and I don't like um <clears throat> I don't know like you've been talking about it for a while I personally I'm not a huge fan of doing this planning of something that is not even close to happening yet so I'd rather discuss what West needs to do now because now West is not doing enough to um help a very very you know to resolve a very very big problem that is it, it is there and that the fact that's the fact that the war is still on and very likely it's not going to end anytime soon and we're entering in some sort of phase two, which is potentially going to be even more um, cruel and more awful than, than what we've seen for the past 50 days. So I think that the West needs to be very brave and very determined when it comes to the sanctions and continue imposing them because now the sanctions, although they have been introduced to a good extent, they're still very patchy, they're still missing a lot of very important people. Um, they are missing Putin's family in, in most jurisdictions. They are, um, the sanctions don't include Putin's girlfriend, Elena Kabaeva, uh, the head of the propaganda um, media holding company. Um, there are many, many things um, to, to, to do and to add in that respect. And also another thing that I really encourage the West to do 
actually not to do. Um, it's very important is that those sa sanctions cannot be lifted under any circumstances. The sanctions should not be lifted if Putin withdraws part of the troops from parts of Ukraine. That's not how it works. No, they need to stay and the uh, mm, Putin shouldn't be able to get away with, uh, with what he did. Um, and any sort of forgiveness and any sort of attempt to negotiate and to find common grounds uh, with Putin is only going to make things worse. I know it's counterintuitive to the Western um, political systems, and I know that um, if you, I don't know, study political science or international relations somewhere in the US or um, in Europe, they would tell you that negotiations are everything that you need to just sit down on the table and discuss and find, find common grounds, and this is how how the world works. So, well, it doesn't work that way with Putin. Uh, he is um, not a uh, he's not willing to negotiate and now we're seeing world leaders who was it it from italy yeah it was draghi from from italy a couple of days ago who said that oh actually it turns out that it's not possible to negotiate with putin he's just telling you that the time hasn't come yet and he repeats it and we gives like history lessons to macron for like three hours on, on another call so it's very important to not loosen the grip um and keep pushing until the desired outcome is risk is there not half of the desired outcome not quarter of the desired outcome no, putin should not be encouraged uh, in any way this behavior is 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 um is it's just pure crime like the um he should be subject to um, a tribunal not to sanctions release of any um shape or form thank you maria uh, we have a question <clears throat> from Stanislav Stans uh, Stanskich uh, from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, who is uh, talking about the exodus out of Russia. Uh, and of, of course, among those who had to flee Russia, and that number is now in the hundreds of thousands, uh, there are people, that, there, there are some of the, the, the representatives of Russian independent journalism, there are um, uh, there, there are human rights defenders. Uh, it's essentially we now have all of Russia's civil society in exile, right? It's democratic diaspora in exile. So how do you think, and I'm here adding to Stanislav's question a little bit, uh, what do you think is the role of this, um, of this Russian civil society that now finds itself outside of Russia? And you, of course, both have been living outside of Russia. So, and, and I think that you have some lessons to teach on how uh, does this group stay relevant and how does it uh, influence the situation right now? Because I think that one of the reasons that Putin's regime always in contrast to the Soviet Union, right? It, it, it didn't mind if people wanted to leave and in fact, in some ways wanted to push them out, perhaps recognizing or hoping that they would lose relevance when they are outside. Uh, but of course, today, there is a way to stay relevant. So I wonder if uh, the two of you have something to say about that. Uh, well, we stay relevant because we don't consider ourselves to be in exile. We stay relevant because we are Russian politicians working with Russian domestic audience. Our core audience is Russian audience. As Maria already said, 90% of our audience on, on YouTube is Russian domestic audience. We, we, we don't try to concentrate on this diaspora. We don't try to build like some, I don't know, political structures or representation. We stay relevant, staying in touch with our uh, numerous supporters within the country and doing things important for them. Like the last project that we have launched is not yet another, like, I don't know, diaspora form, but a, a tracker for consumer prices in Russia based on uh, retail chain uh, prices for consumer goods in Russia. And that has always been our approach. That, that's, that's our answer to this question. I agree completely. I think it's just wrong and it's irrelevant where you're based and you shouldn't be uh, concentrating your political agenda, your political program on the fact that you are a diaspora based abroad. Well, that's, it's, hello, it's 2022. It means nothing where you're physically based. Um, so we consider ourselves uh, 100% Russian organization. We act, work, and we act and work as exactly the same way as we did when we were in Moscow. 
um, and in 88 cities um, where Navalny's headquarters were that Leonid had it. So we are not doing anything anything specific to involve um, to, to involve diasporas, and so we're not going to build Russia outside of the borders of Russia. This is just offensive. Like we want to build Russia in Russia. Like that's that's the plan, and we don't want to settle for anything less than that. For those people who have left and who are leaving, or would, would just leave leave abroad for like I don't know for many 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 years, um, but, you know, like myself. Um, I, we strongly encourage them to now support financial organizations like us, um, organizations like, um, I don't know, independent TV, um, oh, sorry, independent media, whoever is remaining and whoever is rebuilding, you know, those people in, in the Russian diasporas can help them rebuild. They can help to, you know, restart uh, uh, independent television, restart independent newspapers, or they can help NGOs like over there and for who, um, help those people who protest in Russia and being detained and being subject to huge fines and things like that. So I'd say the best use of uh, the diasporas abroad, if they use their voice, which is not restricted by uh, the Russian laws, and they're not risking 15 years in prison and things like that, support if they can financially, those people who they like supporting journalists, NGOs, I don't know, all sorts of organizations and just keep a very, very strong focus on what's going on in Russia. Don't, don't, don't give up on reading about it. Don't give up on talking about it. Don't give up on spreading the word and, um, you know, staying focused on the, on, 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 on the problem. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we have a question from Stanislav Ksenofontov, who's a postdoc at the Arctic Center at UNI. Uh, he is asking about the discussion that's happening now uh, about a possible disintegration of Russia as a result of the current invasion of Ukraine. Uh, do you agree with this prognosis? Do you think there is a chance that Russia will disintegrate? And uh, if this happened, how will Russia develop in the future, given that the it given given all of it, given how much it's integrated now, uh, and and what will happen if it falls apart? I, I I'm going to guess that uh, Daniel has something to say about that. Uh, there is an answer in the videos that I published today, just five hours ago, that Isabel you already mentioned. So I don't want to repeat myself, and I can address uh, Stanislav to this video. But the answer is no. There is no any reason for Russia's disintegration is not going to happen. OK, so people will just have to watch your video. Is it available with the English subtitles at this point? Yes, it is. It is. Great. OK, so so people will have to watch the video to understand why that's not going to happen. Um, let's see. Um, So we have a question uh, from Jennifer Brush, former OSC ambassador to Moldova, who is talking about uh, how in the 1990s, uh, the Americans had something of a fantasy that once communism in Russia falls, then the country would naturally gravitate to democracy and, as, and, and capitalism. And as she writes, instead we got an autocratic kleptocracy. And I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit and, and say, are we not um, sort of falling for another illusion that once Putin's regime falls, uh, that, uh, that Russia may become democratic again? How can we avoid the mistakes and the illusions, perhaps, that, uh, that a lot of us had, perhaps even the opposition in Russia had for many years? What can we do differently this time? Well, once again, we don't know what happens. I mean, these are of us as in possession of a time machine. So this is all a bit of speculation and we don't like speculations in our team because uh, it doesn't make sense. Flexibility has always been key to our survival. We have managed to work under so much pressure, under house arrests, in detention, when our leader was poisoned, when he was comatose, when we had to operate from within the country, from, from outside the country. As you know, we are able to adjust to any changing circumstances, whatever they would be. So, and if that, what, what, what sense does it make to waste time to discuss like the whole scenario, like if this and that? 
let it happen and then we'll be able to adjust and we'll able to figure out what to do but in general uh, the idea is that well Putinism is not designed to over-survive Putin. It's it's very authoritarian regime uh, based on very many personal ties. Like Putin is really, uh, um, Putin is really like running his regime very like manually. And if Putin is gone for whatever reason, there will be at least an enormous window of opportunities for civil society to move things back on track to like a democratic transition, like. Recall that when Stalin dies, uh, died, it took three years of enormous internal fighting of like everyone against everyone, like all his lieutenants starting to kill each other, like Hershov, Malenkov, and Molotov killing Beria, and then Hershov and Mal Malenkov retiring Molotov, and then Hershov uh, retiring Malenkov, and so on. Like, it took them three full years to figure out the succession issue. It will be also the case here and now because by design no one of putin's lieutenants could be strong enough putin can't afford them to be strong because once someone becomes strong once someone becomes a point like official successor putin immediately becomes lame duck and like the, the system will try to find its balance against the presumable successor they are all very weak they don't have any legitimacy they people just don't know them so who knows, like, I don't know, uh, Timchenko or, I don't know, Kostin of general population, like no one. And uh, <clears throat> being being very weak uh, and hating each other, of course, they will start like a fight against each other uh, when uh, Putin is gone, like for whatever reason. This will present us with an enormous window of opportunity and three years at least, and well, this will be our historical mission, not to miss this window of opportunities. And so that, that's the only really interesting thing for me, like to talk about, like what kind of structures we have to, uh, we, we have to manage to build, like in how should we organize people when this happens? So what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on what structures need to be organized? Do you feel that it's, uh, it's uh, not the time to talk about it now? Well, what we are doing for the last 10 years is this. We are like gradually working on increasing our supporter base, on, on being able to reach out to more and more people. On, we, we have also like experienced enormous training in building like horizontal structures. When we, when we built like a network of 85 regional offices, all over the country within four months it has been a very important uh, workout exercise and when we have built our youtube channel to reach like several dozens million people weekly uh, just like from scratch within like few weeks actually this has been another very important exercise we have now all this in our portfolio and like when, when the moment arrives we will be able to act promptly and and to build necessary uh, political structures to, to 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 fight for this democratic transition and also i think it's very it's it's, somewhat, it's a little bit unfair to, to to the russians to formulate it this way because it sounds like um russians made the choice to go you know towards authoritarian um, route and you know they didn't fancy the democracy whatever they, you know when, that they had and then they decided okay no let's go but let's go back to Soviet Union this is not what happened I, I well I mean I don't remember it too well but I do have some recollection of the 90s and uh, from from at least in Moscow at least from what I've seen people like the democracy the Russia Russia worked okay and um, those people who spent their entire lives in Soviet Union they were some of them were still keen to dive in into the new structure, you know, to do the whole capitalism, to try it out, to find the job, to, I don't know, go see the world, um, use the fact that the borders are open, that education is available, and I don't know, and that uh, Russia is represented on the world stage by uh, two uh, girls pretending to be lesbians and singing songs. Like, you know, people, people liked that, that worked. And 
it's not that when Putin came and came to power, uh, Russians demanded him to become authoritarian. No, they were lied to. They were tricked. It was a manipulation that lasted for 22 years, a gradual, smart manipulation where Putin first started with dismantling the independent media. Then he dismantled more and more things, killed people, got rid of elections, got rid of more elections, etc. Et so, so that was that was. Uh, superimposed on Russia. They, we don't really know whether whether um, um, the eighty four percent that Putin claims support him actually support him. So I think, I mean, to be honest, the mistake the mistake is clear. Well, we shouldn't have they shouldn't have chosen um, a KGB person as a successor to Yeltsin. Well, that that's pretty bad, and I think that this mistake will never be repeated again. And I think that this lesson has been learned. But uh, but generally, I think that as long as people have access to the to truthful information, to different points of view, and to just, I don't know, a free, as long as they believe that uh, their votes now will actually will be counted and they are uh, capable of um, electing a, a new president, they will, they, they will do well. And I am confident in our powers that when that day is come, the day of free and fair elections in Russia, that Navalny will do just greatly, and that he will. See, he he's extremely, uh, almost, almost certain. Okay, extremely likely to win. Uh, well, it's interesting because it brings up the question of lustrations, which I remember was discussed so actively in the 1990s. Should there have been lustrations after the communist regime? And of course, that didn't happen for all kinds of reasons. Some people thought that there should have been a Nuremberg trial for communist criminals. And of course, that also didn't happen. Um, and Leonid, I'm again kind of under the influence of your video. I mean, you talk about how now there really won't be a choice but to have, but to do illustration of the, after this criminal war in Ukraine when everything is so clear um, that uh, people who are supporting a criminal regime, that they, they will need to be illustrated. Is that, did I understand you correctly? That, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's it. I mean, <laughs> plain and simple. There is no question about illustration now. So now, I mean, we could have a like debate within the position like maybe uh, a few years ago, but now it's there is just like nothing to debate that these people right. they are war criminals. They they decorated them themselves with their handmade like swastika and right. like it's it's all now not a matter for 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 a debate. Right. Maria, did you want to add something? No, no, I mean, of course. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure whether it's a subject of, you know, illustrations or actually the tribunal, because I think, uh, to be honest, most of the things as they do, like propaganda people and uh, the top government officials and, I don't know, heads of the regions and whoever, like, I don't know, you need to examine it really carefully. But I think that's subject to an international criminal tribunal, not the illustrations. I don't think that many mm -hmm. people will be able to get away with just not just losing their job and not being able to you know be re-employed um mm -hmm. i think that whoever's signature at least like the of members of parliament members of the um council of the federation or whatever it's called like all of those people that's that's a tribunal situation yeah what about people like Valera Gergiev, who's, for example, is the subject of your maria of your uh, yeah. latest investigation what about people like that uh, who are cultural figures but who obviously are deeply corrupt, have benefited from the regime, have have propagandized on the half on behalf of the regime. What do you think about those figures? I think it's it's actually well. First of all, uh, I did, again we kind of we diverged into this beautiful future where we actually you know those things are worth discussing. We are not there yet, and I don't want to you know to waste my energy on something that hasn't happened yet. We're still in um, 18th of April, uh, 2022. Valery Gergiev is not even sanctioned anywhere. He is not. He has his wonderful flat in Manhattan uh, opposite Lincoln Center. Um, he has his uh, great house in, in the Palazzo in Venice and many other assets in, in, in Italy. And he also has uh, a Dutch passport that allows him to travel freely wherever he wants. So let's sort this out first. Does he, it's, does, has, does he deserve to be sanctioned? Absolutely. So he needs to be sanctioned very quickly. He is the guy who whitewashes Putin for years. He started doing it like in, in Ossetia uh, in 2008. Um, he did it in Syria. He's doing it right now. 
and he openly Gergiev openly supports Putin and I'm and I mean he's free to do that but that comes at the price now and that price today would be that he is sanctioned in every jurisdiction he ever wants to stab his foot on and that he's rejected from every opera house from every theater from every stage that he ever wants to uh, to be at again and he will he will never get the standing ovations anymore anywhere outside of, I don't know, city of Tver, um, or, I don't know, somewhere else in Russia. Right. Um, on the question of, I, I, I think that I completely take your point as I look at some of the audience questions, I see, I think that we are all veering kind of into the post-war future, and I completely take your point that we haven't arrived there yet at all. Uh, but let me ask you about uh, something in the current moment that I think there's been a lot of debate about, uh, and that's whether information about the uh, the killed in action might influence the public opinion in Russia. And I see, for example, on social media, people asking, well, why hasn't it happened? So here's Moskva that's gone down. Obviously, you know, whoever was murdered there, the number of soldiers uh, killed uh, in Ukraine, Russian soldiers killed in Ukraine is so high. Is it going to influence public opinion in Russia? Is it influencing it? We are not hearing anything. Um, I don't know if you have a comment on that. I, my, I don't have any qualified um, opinion to do that. I haven't done any like scientific research, but my just general perception is that no, it's not doing anything. Why is that? I think it's hard for uh, Western public to understand because I think in the for the Western public, usually there's, there's sort of a clear connection. As soon as the number of killed in action becomes too high, usually a society wants to withdraw. So the public begins to want to withdraw from the war. Why is it not happening in the Russian society? Because, because you, I think you underestimate the penetration of propaganda. No one knows how many people died. It's like, it's a tiny little circle of people who are screaming and shouting, okay, this many thousands, this many thousands. But we can't even, okay, we have some sort of estimates, but we don't, have, we don't know the actual number. And the actual number, if you trust the, uh, if you trust the government officials, is like I don't know, one thousand people or, or something around that, maybe two thousand people. And it's even to even for that number, you need to do so much digging. It won't be mentioned on TV. Maybe it will be, but on like on fifty eighth minute of the evening show, you know, between the news about I don't know something great that Putin did and something else great that Putin did, you know, it will be squeezed there, a tiny little thing. They don't mention the fact that Moscow, the ship. Um, has been sunk by the Ukrainians. They say it just burns down. Right. There was so a like, fire. Yeah. Yeah. It was a fire that so I don't self ignited or something. I guess some sort of miraculous thing has happened to it. So um, don't underestimate. You know how badly informed people are. They don't know about the thousands of, of, of people dead. And also, and also, Putin did everything to just reduce the worthiness of a person's life to zero over the years this is how he has been like conducting his his uh, policy making like you know a russian soldier's life according to putin is worth nothing okay one dead here another one dead here he ne he never cares about it did he care about soldiers on the submarine and the kursk submarine back in 2001 no he didn't did he care about hostages during the terrorist attacks in moscow he didn't he didn't care about the um any of uh, you know any of those uh, people, any of those mass mass death situations that we have gone through. Normally, in a different society, they would have toppled the regime over, and Putin would be would have been gone ages ago. But that clearly is not how it works. Um, uh, Putin managed to I don't know make people less humane and convince them that their sons. Um, life is worth nothing. It is a huge tragedy and we will take years to convince them otherwise and explain to every person that actually, you know, you know what, your life is worth a lot and your life is worth sacrificing a lot. And I don't know if your life is worth changing laws and drafting new regulations and, you know, many, many things. Uh, but Putin is acting in, in, in an opposite way. States above the person, you know, very, very familiar uh, concept for anyone who has spent a minute in Soviet Union. Right, exactly. And, I remember also, how, and, and, go ahead, and also, go, go ahead. also, we don't have to forget that uh, Russian army is now not what the Soviet army was, with, which which has been like quite egalitarian. Like when, like 
well, conscription uh, was like a total, like it was for everyone and it was pretty much unavoidable. Now, this is just like a burden, a, uh, a tax yeah. for the poorest. Yeah. Uh, like only, only the people from the poorest, like villages and the poorest layers of the society get conscripted and go uh, like the, the consider this like uh, service as a like social lift. And for all others, it's too, too easy to, to avoid. And uh, so far Putin is quite successfully silencing those mothers and videos videos by paying like normal compensations for 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 the deaths of their loved ones uh these compensations are normal in terms of those very poor villages and uh as far as we know like we, we tried to reach out to several of those like mothers and videos uh they they are happy to remain silent because they don't want to lose those compensations but they don't even get those compensations sometimes sometimes a hope for a compensation is enough for them to keep their mouths shut. Like this is yeah. this is messy, but like this is how it works. Because in order to get the compensation, they need to recognize the death, but they don't recognize the death of so many um, of, of so many soldiers and prisoners of war. Um, so it's all like even the hope. Sometimes I think it's just fear. Maybe they just scared. They, they, they sometimes you know it's the simple the simplest explanation is the correct one. I think they might be just scared. Yeah. I think that you're right. There is so much intimidation. So we just have three minutes left. And I want to ask, uh, again, I want to go kind of into the future and think uh, about uh, once this is all over, um, what will have to be done for, for the Russian people to reconcile with the Ukrainian people? I don't know. What, what will it take for that to happen? For the Ukrainian people, like for the Ukrainian well, people, I should say to reconcile with the yeah. I mean, what's um, yes. uh, reparations, uh, reflection, and time. Yeah. Maria, do you have anything to say it's, about that? It's, it's such difficult questions, and uh, to be honest, it's, yeah. that question requires. I think that question needs to be asked Ukrainians first to be asked right. about this and um, where the position are I am. So much damage has been done. I wouldn't even dare to offer, offer a solution for, 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 for the amount of damage that has been done. Like, there will be a day, there will be a solution. We'll think about it. Now it's just too, it's still too close. And it's still too today, you know, to, to, to think about how to fix this in the future. Yeah. I want to thank both of you so much for joining us for this conversation. It, uh, it, it really was a very meaningful discussion, I think, for a lot of us. Um, I want to thank our viewers for joining us today. I'll remind you to please uh, visit our website. Please listen to our podcast, Canon X and Russia File. Please uh, read our latest analysis. We're trying to publish as many independent Russian journalists as we can today, Russia File and Focus Ukraine. Uh, go to our page, Hindsight at Front Ukraine, where we collect all of the information and all of the events that we uh, present. And we'll see you next time. Thank you once again. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you.